All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I think we're ready. And if you want to put your phones on mute. You guys ready? No. Gentlemen? Yes. Ready? All right. Joe Ashley, would you mind leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? No, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> all right thank you everyone for being here i'm going to ask lynn would you mind doing a verification of quorum yes mr president director director van vliet you want to just here. Go uh, director doherty present director cook here, here. vice president cook <laughs> <laughs> president griffiths five president quorum met all right, thank you everyone for uh, giving up, going to PISA for the Chamber of Commerce bingo event and all the money that you are not winning tonight to be here. So thank you for that. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Claude Beauchamp. Did I say that right? Beauchamp. And he is our chairperson for the Finance Committee. I got it, okay. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for showing up, um, show some, uh, you know, interest, and that's always good. Um, so, as uh, um, Renee said, I'm uh, the newly appointed chair for the uh, Finance Committee, and I've been on the committee for about five years, about five years, I believe. But uh, anyways, just to give you an overview of what we do, uh, particularly around this process, around the... Uh, Sorry, I'm Canadian. I say process, not process. <laughs> um, so around around this process, um, basically what it is, is um, first it starts off with um, all the managers of the various departments. Um, in November, they uh, formulate their, their coming fiscal year budget um, with the expenditures and the revenues. Um, they 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 do that and then they uh, present that to uh, uh, to Eric, the general manager, uh, who reviews them. And then what we do on the finance committee is we we sort of um, spread out into teams, and then we uh, basically have a meeting with each of the managers to look over, uh, discuss, um, review, you know their their numbers, question question uh, some of the numbers um, for their validity, um, make suggestions, recommendations, you know, just a, another, um, you know, another mind thinking over it. So then we go through through all the, uh, um, all the departments and, um, and then we, um, uh, then we come together, uh, which we did, uh, um, at the end of January for a two day session. And uh, just as a finance committee in, in total, we reviewed all the uh, department's budgets, uh, went over the questions and, um, you know, tried to put like a, um, a fine look at, at everything. We come up with possible recommendations, um, you know, to present to the board on changes or, or different approaches or, or whatever it might be. So, but um, in, and then after that's been all accepted, um, then we come here tonight to uh, basically have a work workshop, share it with you and, um, and then uh, get, get preparation for uh, the board's approval uh, at their, their next meeting. So, but uh, just just to give you an idea, um, so this um, this uh, review that we did, um, we basically were able to fine tune the budget 
for next year, which was at an 8.6% increase over the previous year, we were able to uh, hone it down almost a point to 7.8%. So, you know, trying to save the membership some, uh, some money. So um, I think that's about it. Thank you, Claude. And also thank you to everyone who's in the finance committee. I always uh, bring this with me so you can see this is what they get. And it's a list, it, it goes into detail. So instead of just utilities, we, they know how much it was for water, electricity. So they get granular and appreciate all the time, not just in the meetings, but the times that they spend at home going through it, preparing for their meetings with the managers and then for the two day meeting um, to, to fine tune all the numbers. So thank you for all that great work. And now I'm gonna turn it over. Oh, one more little bit of housekeeping. Um, this is a workshop, so it's going to be a little bit more free flowing when it comes to comments at the end. If you have any comments that's not related to the finances that we're going to be chatting about, if you can fill out a comment card. If you have comments that's going to be related to this, feel free to just raise your hand when it's time for comments and then we'll call you up. And then you can just state your name and your track and lot at that time. And then the board, if they have any questions as Susan's presenting, please feel free to ask any, you know, any clarifying questions or anything that you need. That will turn it over to Susan. Thank you. And I want to say this is an absolutely stellar turnout and I recognize some of you, so that's all great. So I'm so glad you're here. First of all, I'm gonna let you know a little bit about the format of the meeting. Renee covered some of it, but basically I'm gonna provide a budget overview for you and some comparisons. And just so you have a general idea of what's in this budget and why parts of it were increased. And then uh, after that, Renee is gonna do a pr presentation regarding funds and the discussion will follow that. So to get started, this is an overview by department. I'm hoping you can see the screen. So we have 19 departments. And overall, Claude had already mentioned that the budget is currently standing at a 7.8% increase over the prior year's budget. And we all know since COVID what's happening out there in the financial world with inflation, payroll costs, et cetera, et cetera. I think personal opinion 7.8% may be very reasonable considering our current economic environment. I did highlight uh, four departments that make up the largest portion of the increase year over year. And those are, and I'll go down and give you a brief explanation. In fact, I have that on the next page. The accounting department is uh, reporting an increase in subsidy. That means less money. Uh, and that's mainly due to escrow fees that we charge when the homeowners sell their properties. We are projecting much less volume next year. And that's causing the majority of that $171,000 increase to our budget. We did increase the closing costs that we charge for the labor we do and the transactions of actually changing the ownership of the properties by 10% just to offset that cost of the reduced uh, volume a little bit. And in the corporate department, that is uh, demonstrating an increase of $338,000 increase in the budget for this year. And basically that's due to an increase in legal fees, uh, projected insurance really, really went up. And I am speaking about liability insurance. And that is a direct factor of having gone through COVID. Um, and we also, in addition to that, we had to project well over $100,000 additional in the bad debt um, because we're facing a slower economic time and projections on um, maybe homeowners that get into some trouble with making their payments. So that is in the budget that you're gonna be seeing. The lake increase cost year over year for the budget is 129,000. And that's pretty much able to be nailed down because we have an actual contract with the um, Elsinore Valley Water District. And we budgeted the maximum per contract increase and that would be a 4% year over year. And that cost kicks in in September of every year. 
the common areas uh, are the fourth largest of our increase or the fourth department that has a large increase. Um, and that's mainly due to an increase in utility costs. We're projecting about a 13% increase in every, almost every category of utility, water and electric. And I think most of you may be already seeing that in your personal utility bills at the moment. So you will under, probably understand. This is an overview of the revenue. And you can see that by this pie chart and the largest portion of this is made up of our sales and user fees. Our sales and user fees include the golf fees, the room rentals, the campground, equestrian fees and restaurants. Basically all of the amenities that you enjoy here in the community. Those are your user fees. That does not include your assessment revenue. The other income categories made up of violations, event income, and we have a cell phone tower that we, we receive rental income on every month. These are your expense, your budgeted expense categories in a pie chart form. So you can see at a glance, what are the largest expenses that we have in the budget? The, the largest expense is our payroll and salary costs. We have 150 employees, ranging from restaurant employees all the way up to Eric. So that's quite a few employees and it does cost quite a bit of money as you can see at 8.095 million. The outside services category that you see in the orange are made up of uh, community patrol and the landscaping for the the landscaping services for all common areas, golf course, et cetera, et cetera. Those are outside services. And we all enjoy those. I always like to mention what we're looking forward uh, at when we go into the new fiscal year. Uh, payroll is always at the top of the list. You've already seen that that's our largest expense. The minimum wage just went up 50 cents this year, which is not a huge impact to our budget. Most of our um, lower wage employees are already a little bit extra just because we have such pressure in the labor market right now. So that was generally a small impact. Um, as far as cost of living increases, we have budgeted 5% overall for the uh, for this coming budget for all the employees. And that's not a given. It is based on merit, but it's based individually, but as a general rule for the budget, that's what has been put in. Something to mention, as you already know, inflation has been pretty much runaway. It is predicted to come back down a little bit to a lower level. Uh, but this was on the mind of our managers as they were looking forward into this next year as to budgeting their expenses. I already mentioned the lake lease is at 4%, utilities is increased at 13%. The cost of food at the restaurants is budgeted from 31 to 33%. It wasn't just escrow fees, uh, transactions, user fees that were increased across the board. There was a general increase in most of our user fees in this budget just to keep pace with inflation and to help reduce the budget, um, budget uh, budgeted expense increases. The Finance Committee had a few recommendations. I'm mentioning this mostly for the board. Um, we would recommend that, or they would recommend that we leave the pool hours at reduced hours. Uh, I think there was some discussion to increase the pool hours. Um, they did recommend an increase in outside golf of 9% and an increase in members annual golf at 4%. I think both of those are coming in on the budget or around 2% right now is where it stands. Uh, a small item is increasing the horse trailer rental fee to $60. And that's a request and adding $50 per year to the dock fees that um, is not in the budget, I don't believe. 
And uh, they were recommending a 9% increase to horse board fees. And that didn't quite come in at that, um, that rate. And remember, that's just recommendations in general from the Finance Committee. They did approve to present this budget as is to you. And those particular increases are not included in the numbers. That's just food for thought. Question? <clears throat> yes. On the uh, reduced hours for the pool, and that it would be the, it's reduced from going. And I guess the question is, are the hours for the pool going to be the same as they were in 2023, 2020? I heard there was some discussion. I don't have the answer to the final decision. I think that was put in the budget, however, for to have reduced increased hours and payroll. Um, do you know or not? Do, do you have? I can answer. So when we did the preliminary budget, we had discussion about uh, considering opening the pool a little bit old, a little bit sooner in the season, but we went back to our normal seasonal hours, mid-March to end of November. Okay, Thank so, you. What's, so what's in the budget is the same as this same last year? Same as prior years. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I was apparently repeating gossip of some kind. <laughs> Um, there are some unusual items to consider uh, this year, and I think most of you may already know of some of these. Uh, there is the item of the sale of the fire station. Just so everyone knows, for budgeting purposes, that would be recorded as a gain loss on a sale of an asset, and that's not generally part of an operating fund. So that would not be a windfall, a windfall to um, the next year's budget at whatever time that actually takes place, if it takes place. And so that, uh, I wanted to put that out there. But however, if that sale does take place, what will most likely take place is a 20% capital gains tax on that sale. That is a category that is included in the operating budget. And that may be a consideration. And roughly that would be approximately back of the envelope, generally $278,000 or $300,000. We have a second item that's called the ERC credit. And for those of you who do not know what that is, um, the federal government is uh, continuing to provide these credits. These were uh, passed as legislation during COVID to assist employers. The credits are still available. We have employed a uh, firm to calculate our credit because the calculation is quite complex. And that has come in at uh, $2.7 million as a refund against the payroll costs that we paid out during 2020 and 2021. The impact of receiving that money uh, is within 12 months or right at 12 months. It's not an immediate credit. It is not like the PPP loan that we got the money immediately. It's a longer term uh, process where we have to apply for the refunds and the IRS will most likely take that much time. Um, we will have to pay a little bit of tax on that. We, I recalculated that from what we spoke about in a previous meeting. And right now it's roughly maybe $220,000. Due to the timing of receiving that money, um, it's questionable whether that should be put in this next year's budget or not. Um, and that can be another item for discussion. What also needs to be discussed along with that is the professional fees to have had that calculated uh, may need to go on the budget because we most likely will pay that if we receive the monies and that's $203,000. And that is currently not in the budget. And that would be in the category of professional fees. And finally, this is probably what everybody's been waiting for. This is your assessment, your new assessment uh, for the year. Um, the Finance Committee is recommending repair and replacement funds at $2.775, $2,775,000, the road reserve at $2 million, and the capital improvement project at $500,000. If we add those to the operating budget that I just presented, 
And we also include the surplus, subtract the surplus from the prior year's operational budget. That calculates a $3,816 annual assessment. And if you divide that into 12 months, it's $318. Finally, I'll just mention the next step in this process is for the board to approve this. I think it's March 7th, if I looked at my cal calendar properly. Um, they'll approve it in open session, and then the final budget will be out to the homeowners uh, on March 31st. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. First, open to the board for any questions or yeah, I have a, a clarifying question. So I noticed in going through the budget, uh, Susan and uh, and Finance Committee, when we did the Lodge and Lighthouse budget, um, let me back up first. First of all, I want I want to say <clears throat> good job on the budget overall. I think there's a, there are several <clears throat> success stories in this budget. Um, the campground is running a profit. That's that's really good news for us. The uh, golf course is showing an 18 percent reduction in subsidy, which is tremendous. For us, and so it's a good work by the by the, um, <clears throat> by the golf pro and 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 the and the users of that. Uh, the restaurants have reduced their subsidies year over year, uh, and and the overall increase in the operating budget is below what inflation was running. So I think there's a lot of good news stories in the budget. So I want to commend you for for all that. One clarifying question now: I know as we're looking at the lodge and lighthouse budget, one kind of amazing thing in there is it's showing a, a hundred thousand dollar improvement if you combine. The lighthouse and the meeting rooms together, a hundred thousand dollar improvement over last year. And the question I have is: this do uh, is this due to increased anticipated revenue? I'm actually going to let Lynn answer that question. Thank you, Susan. Yes, sir. So last year, going into the budget, coming out of COVID, we did a moderate uh, banquets forecast for the fiscal year, which we exceeded. Uh, this year, going into it, we built in an increase. We took into account everything on the books year to date, and then um, the projected increase, and that's where we came up the uh, forecast number for this next fiscal year. Okay. So that's why it was significantly higher. Okay, so a follow-up question then is, did, when we did this budget build and also the budget review with the Finance Committee, we... Um, we didn't know what the scope of the lodge remodel and renovation was, and did we include the fact that, that now it, this renovation it could go through September uh, on this. And so the question I've got is, is it really realistic that that $100,000 improvement over last year is achievable given what we know now? Yes, sir. So based on the banquets that were on the books at the time, that was the forecast that we used. We did take that into consideration when we built the budget. We had a discussion about it. I also spoke with Eric about it. We still wanted to be conservative, but we were taking into account everything that was scheduled because the Holiday Bay Room is not being closed during construction and we're actually booked for the year. So we were trying to be conservative, but not under budget. A particular finance committee member asked me to be realistic for this next fiscal year. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. <laughs> Hopefully, did that answer your question, sir? That was great. Thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments? I don't. I didn't see this anywhere, and I don't know if it could be factored in yet. But at some point next year's budget, solar's panel will be up and running. Um, between the lodge, the country club, and golf field, we're roughly one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars a year in electricity. Um, do we think we can recoup some of that when we could just flip the switch on those solar panels? That may be an Eric question. Was that a question? That was a question. It okay. probably is for Eric. <laughs> Wasn't sure who that was for. Um, that was that was considered. Um, the date we flipped the switch is um, not definite. But um, that that was discussed and that was considered um, top to bottom, so it's it's part of this document. Any other questions? Nope. All right, we're gonna go ahead. I just want to make sure we're good. 
All right, we're gonna go in and we're gonna chat about reserves. This is something I put together. And I say that because I'm not a PowerPoint expert. So you'll see that not all the colors match and it's not as pretty as other slides that you've probably have seen. So I just finished it before I got here. Uh, so just to let you know where we're at with our three reserve funds. Um, and I just got these numbers. Thank you, Susan, for working on them for me and getting them to me today. So right now, um, our balance is as of January 31st and the repair and replacement, there's a little bit over 8 million additional contributions for uh, February, March, and April will total 507,000, leaving us with 8.5 million and change. Road reserve, where you can see 9.669 and change. Additional contributions, 498, leaving us with 10,197 and change. And then capital improvement, that's what I always refer to as the vacation, the fund money. We're at 1.246 million with 249 additional coming in, uh, leaving us with a total of 1.495. Now, this assumes that there's no other expenditures. And I will say that is 100% unlikely. I never like to say I guarantee you, but I pretty much guarantee we're gonna spend some money um, over the next few months. So I just wanted you to know that that's where we sit um, from the reserve perspective. Good, all right, next. So road reserves, um, for those who weren't aware, we spent, a little bit over $5 million on our roads last year. I think it was about 5.6 million on our roads. It's a huge plan um, carrying to 2031 and possibly beyond if, you know, depending on what happens, but the goal is to have it all completed by 2031. So um, Eric worked with, is it GMU, I believe? And they set up what we need to do in different increments in order to achieve um, an optimal, let's go ahead and turn to the next slide so they can see the little graph, um, predicted PCI. So trying to get us into the 80% range. So you can see in 2022, 5.6 million. Um, in 2023, they were estimating 5 million, but we're gonna spend anywhere between five and 6 million. We did receive the um, settlement from the other company just leave it at that. And you can go online and log in and look at the details of that. Um, so we do have some extra money to apply. And we're also going to, I say we as if I'm doing it, we're going to slurry seal the roads that were just completed in order to help protect them. So we're going to spend anywhere between five or 6 million. What you'll see on this slide, and, and it's all in your budget, by the way, if anyone has their annual budgets, that is in there. Um, so you can always reference it there. But when they're showing how much we're going to spend year over year, it wasn't factored for inflation. So I like to plan for the future. So I started looking at inflate, you know, what happens, what, what will it really cost? Because what 2.2 million will buy us in 2024 will not buy us the same thing in 2028. So we go to the next slide. So I was just trying to figure out from a funding perspective and looked at the inflation adjusted cost. Um, to look at what we would need to fund on a consistent basis. And you can see we're right around 2 million. It leaves us with a balance potentially in 2031 of 1.2 million. Now boards in the future may want to increase that because what that does include, that's just to um, put in the new roads. That doesn't include if we need to update a gate or fix a gate, uh, fairway estates and their gates there, if we're going to do any changes or additions since they don't have gates right now, Anytime we repaint, that costs money. That's attributed to the road reserves. Of course, slurry seals throughout the, well, as long as we have the roads, we're going to always slurry seal them to try to keep them in the best condition. Certainly when crosswalks need to be added or they need to be repainted, that'll come out of the road reserve. So future boards, I know it's uh, um, it was, the suggestion was 2019000 and change to go into reserve, into the road reserve. But I just wanted you to see how that all plays out and that's not a number I feel that the board should really um, play around with when it comes to funding, simply because it'll help keep us on track. And Eric, Eric has said to me before, could we extend beyond 2031 if we needed to? Yes, but I don't think that's the ideal thing to do when we have 37 miles of road and it's one of our largest, if not the largest asset inside Canyon Lake because we own the roads and we want to keep them safe for everyone. So that's on the road. Any questions from you guys? 
Can you clear, clarify the PCI for people who aren't familiar with that? I'll let Eric do that. Thank you. Yeah, so PCI is Pavement Condition Index, and we hire uh, GMU, which is a um, asphalt engineering company. And when we started our pavement rehabilitation project, our pavement condition index was in the high 60s, low 70s, and that's poor. And so our goal is to, uh, when we repave a street on that day, the pavement condition index is 100%. The next day, um, it starts to dip below 100%. And in five years, that, that same street that was 100% the day it was constructed, maybe 95%, um, whatever. whatever. Um, so every, uh, every day, every year, the pavement condition index of a given street goes down. Our goal is to, uh, when we started this, this um, multi-year project, uh, we had delayed this project until we got some litigation funds. And so we were a little behind the ball. And um, our goal was to do 5 million in year one. We're about to embark on year two coming up. And in year two, we're gonna do another 1.3 million square feet, uh, just like we did last year. Uh, but we're also going to go back and slurry seal, um, seal coat uh, the 1.3 million that we did last year. That's about a six million dollar project. So the the overall goal is to get up uh, and where our overall PCI is about 80 percent plus, um, and uh, how much we bite off every year uh, will determine how fast we get to that point. So. Yeah, and I had. I remember hearing that, what it stood for, but when you said, I'm like, I have no idea. So thank you, Eric, for that. All right, next slide. Capital improvement project. So this is the fund money. Um, so right now our balance is 1.246. We already went over this. So total, if we didn't spend any more money is 1.495. Now we do need to subtract out 500,000 that the board approved for the lodge patio renovation that will come out of capital improvement. So if the board approved no other projects, then there would be 995,000, almost 996 going into the next fiscal year. The finance committee has also recommended that we contribute another 500,000. So that would bring it close to 1.5 million. However, the board is going to be presented with some additional capital improvement projects. One that we chatted about last at the last session that we're going to be presented with the cost for two additional pickleball courts. So that'll be discussed in March. If that's of interest to you, I recommend that you come to that meeting. We're already starting to receive emails on that and we do welcome member input. Um, but as you can see, even if that project is approved, whatever that number is, there's certainly enough money in there for the next board, whoever comes in to have um, creative power, I guess, and just have a lot of fun with, you know, improving the community. We don't certainly want to, you know, I, one thing I love about this board is we want to make sure the next board, whoever that is, is in an optimal space to make some capital improvements and continue with that model and go forward. So go to the next slide. Repair and replacement reserve. So in 2021, we started using a software called Smart Property. And it actually reminds me of financial planning software I used to use back in the day. It allows us to um, enter things in real time. And um, I'll dive a little bit more into that in a little bit. One thing to know, there's 1,017 components in the reserve report that is available to you on our website. So you just have to go under financials, but the entire reserve reports there and it does list absolutely everything. Now, some of these components have, you know, greater quantity. So a great example is happy camp, the picnic tables. It's listed as one component, but there's 50 of them as a quantity. So it gets multiplied out. So everything is accounted for. Um, even doors are in there, which is fascinating. All our security cameras are in there. Um, one thing uh, that's in there right now is Vacation Park. All 20 components of Vacation Park that makes it is now in that reserve report. We don't have to wait until the new three-year analysis. So that's in there. And I'll get to that in a moment. So you can see all the different categories. Hopefully you can. Um, so we'll go on from there. Any questions on the categories or? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, has... <clears throat> We know there's, like you said, there's doorknobs in there and stuff like that, but 
I'm being facetious. Okay. But um, has has it been scrubbed? Because last time we reviewed that, you know, there we we uh, developed a criterion to say, okay, so if something needs to be repaired or replaced every every year or every other year, like the useful life is one or two or three years, that's in reality an operating expense. So has the uh, has the software been scrubbed for all that stuff to take it out? There are items, even though it has a, a useful life of one or two years, do qualify to be in the reserve report and as a reserve item. And I did look into that um, actually when I came on the board and we had many chats and with legal and we were looking up documents, but it doesn't have to be in operating. So but, but, it hasn't been pulled out. I don't think, I don't know how many items were pulled out because that was in 20, I wasn't on the board in 2021 when items may have been pulled out. Um, so I don't, I don't know if specific items have been moved over to I, operating. I, I think I can answer your question. So the reserve specialist comes here um, as mandated by law every three years. And uh, they, in the reserve study, you will find that everywhere there's a door, because uh, you asked about doorknobs, there's probably about $1,200 in the reserve study to replace the door, replace the door closer, replace the doorknobs, replace the kick plates, replace the frame. Um, and that that's their job. They come here and they give a 30,000 foot look and they say, you have a thousand doors. Um, each door is probably 900 to $1,200. You asked about have we scrubbed it and taken out a doorknob that we might replace every every year, um, because that should be an operating cost to do regular maintenance. Right. Um, the answer is that if there's twelve hundred dollars in to replace this door, it should be in there. Um, but in the operating budget, we have um, miscellaneous repairs, building maintenance. And there's also a, an operating sum. So if we were to go in there and say, well, we fixed that doorknob last year, that kind of minute detail, we would never waste our, our labor, our staff's labor to go in and say, we, we replaced a $50 doorknob. We're, we're not gonna go adjust that number because it's, it's an independent consultant's number. So the idea is to cover our 1,017 components and, and a door isn't a component necessarily an individual component. Sometimes it's a whole building or an area. Um, so they're, both of those numbers are valid. To have the, the door and the doorknob in the reserve study is, is correct. And to have it have money in our um, repair and replacement um, maintenance fund in the operating fund is also valid. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but they're both correct. I'm reading. I'm reading no. <laughs> as the well, at, at a doorknob level, the answer is no. Um, at a level like this holiday bay room floor, which is a thirty thousand dollar item, when this item gets replaced, we absolutely go in there and scrub it and say we've replaced the floor, we reset the the useful life to zero, and um, and and the clock starts ticking again. A doorknob, no. Right. No, I, I'm, I'm just referring to stuff. Actually, uh, what uh, when we were looking at it, uh, was it uh, last time we looked at it was uh, I was looking at so sort of like the, uh, the tree trimming out on the uh, golf course. That's done every year. That's that should be a normal maintenance. And that that has been moved budget. in large part that has moved to operating. Okay. The reserve study will still show you have X number of trees. And in case they all die, you need to replace those. But tree trimming is a maintenance item that's absolutely a part of the operating budget. Okay. Like sorry. Uh, they just look at it at the thirty thousand dollar level or thirty thousand foot level. But we live at the thirty foot level, so we should be able to, you know, tweak it the way we see fit. And we do, and you're, you're, you, you make the perfect analogy, and I use this all the time. We hire them, they come in for maybe a week every three years. We live here day in, day out, 365 days a year. And so our knowledge of, of those 1,000 components and 
and what needs to happen to them is way more accurate than the reserve study will ever be. They say, you have an air conditioner on the roof of this. They don't necessarily climb up and look at it. Um, we do have photos of those, but um, they may take the photos that were taken three years ago and take another photo of it. And they just go, well, last time someone climbed up there, it, it, we, we guessed that it had a five year remaining useful life. And it's a guess. If it breaks tomorrow, we're still going to dip into the repair and replacement funds sure. and replace that air conditioner. We just replaced two on this building, regardless of what the money said in the reserve sure. fund and the, the remaining useful life. So uh, practical day to day, totally different from the reserve study. Right. And that's that's the right. run of my question. The, the ongoing day to day maintenance should be removed from now. Thanks. All right. Um, one more thing is I just want to point out, as you can see, that there's over a thousand components. Uh, so unlike other POAs and HOAs, we have a massive number of amenities, and we're going to do a presentation on that, which I'm excited about. Uh, replacing these items, it's spread out over decades. Our, those reports, if you take a look at it, it's over the next 30 years. There's some items that have a useful life of 20, <clears throat> some are 10, some are, um, and they recur and they'll show up on the report. So that's all calculated in. So we're not a typical HOA or POA where all we have is a building and a pool. So when it comes to a certain percentage being funded, it's critical so you don't have a special assessment that you're at the higher level. Um, all right, so next slide. And this is so tiny and I'm so sorry, but this is from your board budget book or your annual. So everyone can grab this. Um, when they want to. So what I want to point out, and I'm going to read from here so I don't mess up, This it's a scenario, first of all, um, that demonstrates how much we would need to contribute to the reserve fund in order to maintain a funding level of 60%. It assumes that we only replace the items on the list for that specific year versus when needed. And you can even see, or maybe you can, and you can look at the budget book, it assumes that the contribution in 2021 that was only going to be, I think it was like 1.8 million and change. It was showing a lot less than what we actually funded. So I want to give you an example of how this is just a scenario versus reality. So in 2021, this is a year before we were on the board, the prior board approved spending up to $2 million to replace the golf irrigation system. According to the 2018 reserve report, it should, should be replaced in 2024. Almost 1.4 million was spent during fiscal year 21-22 to complete the project approved by the prior board. So did the prior board make a, de a bad decision by moving the, for the project forward and having it done earlier than expected? Absolutely not. They made the correct decision. The project needed to be completed earlier, and the board, in fact, saved the members quite a bit of money, especially as Susan was talking to the cost of water going up. That irrigation system also was discussed, and the finance committee even discussed it. I remember talking about that. Um, should we do it in two phases or one? Because it was a big nugget when you did it in one, but the savings overwhelmingly made the choice. Um, or the recommendation from the finance committee that having it completed in one. So that's an excellent example, just looking back of when a prior board pulled the trigger. That's probably not the best phrase to use now. Made the decision to um, move forward with a project that wasn't on the board budget book. So I wanted to point that out. Okay, next slide. So uh, this is where... And you see this shows 2022. And what I redacted, it just showed that it was the final approved uh, reserve, which it doesn't because this is current. You can see that the starting reserve balance is what the starting reserve balance was this year is 7.339 million in change. Um, again, the software is similar to uh, financial planning software I've used in the past. This is this software and being able to look at this it's what I refer to as a, a breathing document. It is ever changing. And to give you a great example, and I mentioned it earlier, Vacation Park is now on there. All 20 components are in the reserve for that. Um, also, uh, I checked today and the new air conditioning units were just input today. 
Um, this I printed a few days ago, so that doesn't include that. So they are constantly able to update this. The other thing I wanted to point out is in 2223, it shows that the anticipated expenditures were $2.2 million. Whereas if you looked at the if you looked in this budget, what was done in 2021, they were assuming it was going to be a lot less. And the reason for that is if something isn't broken and doesn't need to be replaced, they don't go out and say, you know, Eric and Steve don't look at it and say, well, we're supposed to replace that air conditioning unit, even though it's working perfectly, they let it go. They might have to do a little repair to keep it functioning, new batter, whatever's needed for it, but they keep it going. That item pushes into the next year because the remaining useful life is zero. So it doesn't come off. I just want to make sure everyone knows it doesn't come off. It gets pushed into the next year. That's why you'll see that it's showing that we're going to spend 2.2 million this year if we were using this as the Bible. I believe we've only spent about 1 million out of repair and replacement so far. Um, so again, it's ever changing and um, just keep that in mind. It's, I just want you guys to keep it in mind because there seems to be some perception that what's in here is 100% accurate. And if it deviates or you know there's something that's approved differently, um, that it's incorrect or it's the wrong decision. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and this was a, the other thing I wanted to point out because a lot of questions have come up about the lodge renovation and the impact to the reserves. So when we tasked Eric with going out to secure bids, on the renovation, um, on the lodge renovation that was designed in 2018, and also the lodge patio renovation that was designed a bit later, I began to look at the impact, if any, to the anticipated funding level to the re repair and replacement reserve. Because I, what I didn't want to see, and this was um, shared with me too by prior board members and looking at the, the reserves, is there have been times, and I didn't bring it with me, where a board member has um, or prior boards have contributed nothing to the reserve. And then other boards have to come in and start to shore up that. And I remember, you know, some of the boards just a few years ago, and I'm looking at Dell Welty right now, because he was on one of them, where they had to make the right and tough decision. And people were upset with them when they had to increase the reserves because they needed to shore it up from um, challenges that were made in the past. And uh, by prior boards and having it down to zero. So you took the hard knocks on that one. Uh, so going on, stand by. So what I did is I started utilizing st uh, smart property. I began to look, I can line it up. And if anyone ever wants to go through the software with me, I enjoy it. So I would gladly do that. Um, but I first started looking at all the components for the lodge that's listed on smart property. And I pulled all those out that were going to be spent over the next several years. And I went through them with Eric and those amounts totaled about 799,000. Um, so I had the first almost 800,000. And then as, as I continue to look at the reserve reports, digging a little bit deeper, uh, I found that in the year 2027, 28 fiscal year, that on the reserve report was 2.388 million for dredging the lake. Now, when that was put on there, I believe there was probably the possibility that we could dredge the lake, which unfortunately we can't dredge the lake because no one wants our toxic sludge. So when I saw that we had already about 800,000 allocated and we already have 2.3 that was in there for dredging the lake, that's where when I was looking at it, combining that to almost 3 million, to, well, a little bit over 3 million, and we only need to spend 2.4 out of the lodge. So I wanted you to know that that's when I was going through the numbers, um, seeing how it could impact the increase to the lodge. So going, if we can go back one the other way. So the funding on this scenario, if we can enlarge it, it's, it's showing that next year, instead of 2.775 million that the board may want to consider, and this will be discussed in March, an amount lower than that. And um, so I just wanted to point that out, just the, the process behind 
for me at least making that decision to move forward with the lodge renovation. So questions on that, on the reserves. And again, I would be happy to sit with anyone. We can meet up over at the POA office and go through the software. If you wanna get granular about all the different components, I really enjoy it. Um, so the next, I know, I do, I love my numbers, I know. Um, so this, I, this is just a screenshot that I put on there so you could see that it was listed on there. And then the next slide, that one we're gonna hold off. And um, if we can switch over to the amenities one. But before we leave that subject, can I can I offer a, a point uh, on the uh, regarding reserves? We we had a pretty good process for for developing the reserve study that's been proven over many years, right? And we have POA staff certainly goes through it. Uh, we have a, a joint committee of the finance committee and and the facilities committee that that reviews it in detail and they go through it. And then every third and and they they come up with what's what goes into the, that study and then what goes into the or what gets approved by the auditor, I guess, or the, the company we hire happens every three years. Um, <clears throat> and so I think we've got, to, each time we've done that, it gets better and we've come up with a, a better result. And, and, and in any given year, all you can do is use the best information you've got. And the next year you always have better information, right? Because there's new things. And so and so as a result, it gets better over time. <clears throat> and, and so I think the studies that we have done and the reserve studies, they, they, they are used, as you said, I completely agree. It's not, a, it's not a line item to spend against. It's a yardstick we use to, to determine the health and risk of, of our community. Um, and I think, and so I think the studies we've got are good. And I think when we do it again next year, when the staff and the, and the subcommittees go through it, we'll do even a better job knowing it. Um, but I do wanna caution, I think it's risky for us to go on and, 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 and select line items to remove from it arbitrarily without going through the due processes. And so I just think as a, uh, uh, I, I, would, I would recommend that we fall back on our process for maintaining the integrity of, of that review kind of year over year. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that we right now or the board make a decision to remove that, especially with the next reserve study happening in 2024. Um, and when that happens, I think it'll naturally be removed since we can't dredge the lake. So why would we keep that in there? Um, cause that wouldn't be fair to the members to keep it in there. So knowing that the money's been already, you know, monies have already been set aside to spend in short period of time, 2.3 million that allows us to continue looking at funding at a level of maybe 2.1 million into the reserves and still have this lodge re renovation completed without as much impact as, as one would think. And the other thing too, and the one, one thing I love about this software, and I'm so grateful that Eric was able to negotiate a much lower rate for us to continue to use this on a go forward. But for those who are gonna be in the finance committee or the subcommittee, knowing that these items are constantly being updated, I think is gonna help a great deal because I remember when I was part of it last time, some of the questions of, was it added? Was it not added? Um, and there was a lot more work in that. So I. I really appreciate the software and thanks for negotiating that right. Yeah, and I can add to that, that since I've been here, I think 2016, when I got here, the reserve study was done by company A. Um, and when that, that expired in 2019, I think. And so we went out and got a uh, second reserve company, different one, company B. And that one um, had very few photographs and it was basically just a carbon, you know, they took the data from the previous consultant and kind of re-estimated the numbers and it wasn't very impressive. Um, and company C, the third company that we've hired since I've been here is uh, Smart Property and, and we hired them to go do a much more granular, um, they probably spent a couple weeks here, took a lot of photographs and part of uh, part of their product was, this online software. And so when, when we replaced these air conditioners, um, we started with a binder and then we had a PDF of, of an Excel spreadsheet. And now we have um, a very, like a living document, like Renee said, where when we replace the air conditioners on here, our operation staff goes in and immediately resets that useful life to zero. And, um, and it, it's, a, it's a much better service and I, you know, I don't see any reason to go away from them, so. 
and not that we want anything bad to happen, but if there was a fire, they have the serial numbers in it. It's, it's very detailed now what we can do. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, so the next thing before we get to the very last, this is something I just wanted to show, although I think everyone here appreciates all the amenities, but what it takes to run Canyon Lake and all the amenities that are uh, here and available for everyone. This is actually part of a presentation I learned today that our communications is making for people who are interested in moving into the community or just bought a home in here. So we can just flip through the sides. So as you know, there's 17 parks and beaches. Uh, so when we look at the cost of caring for this water and electricity, there's a lot to water. Um, I think one thing that's really important too is while we do have a contract for people to come in and take care of it and mow the lawns, we do have an operations team. They're the ones who are coming in, they're taking care and making sure the restrooms are clean. If there's vandalism that occurs, they're the ones who are coming in and fixing it. So, uh, you know, it's part of our 150 people that are here taking care of all of these amenities. So next slide. Um, as you can see, we have several courtesy docks. I know we're, we're in process or have just recently replaced a few of them. Indian Beach, I believe was installed last year. Um, but again, these are things that are on the, the reserve items. And um, I do see the operations team come out and uh, spray it down because birds love to hang out on our docks and it is disgusting. So again, the, that's part of the work that goes on and part of the cost of keeping our docks as clean as possible. And we have Vacation Park, which is our newest amenity. Um, and that, you know, that gets added to the operating costs. So thank God, hopefully we won't need to spend that much money in water. But, and then the golf course. So again, this is something that as people are interested in moving here, they're going to be having access to all this information, which is a great way to market. And if you're a realtor, it's a great marketing tool as well when you're trying to sell a house and why you want to move into Canyon Lake. And the, again, everyone here I feel comfortable knows about all the amenities and the cost to run them, but there are some people who don't understand. And then Happy Camp, which I know a lot of people here frequent. Um, if there's 50 RV spots. We just took care of upgrading. Actually, it was a complete renovation of the restrooms. So if you had, haven't had a chance, I recommend going over there. They are ADA compliant, and that's critically important when uh, people are camping there. We want everyone to feel welcome and be able to use those restrooms and even take a shower. And of course, we have our sport courts. Uh, pickleball, again, is going to be discussed at the next meeting. So if that's something of interest, please email the board or attend the meeting because we'd love to hear your opinion um, on whether or not the board should move forward with adding two additional pickleball courts. Um, and then we have two fantastic light uh, restaurants. Um, we can go to the next one too. Um, and I know everyone's been enjoying those. So it costs a lot to run this community. We have a lot of amenities, uh, but it's pretty fantastic here. And then, yeah, we can keep going through. And our equestrian center. And we can go through. We're good. All right, so if you're a realtor, or you know someone is a realtor, I recommend you having them look at those slides. So with that, we're going to open this up. <clears throat> if anyone has any comments on our amenities from the board, your favorite amenity? I'm not on amenities, but just, I guess I had one additional clarifying question, if you don't mind me. Sure, going no, back. it's a workshop. <laughs> and that is the finance committee recommends, Susan, you said this finance committee provide these recommendations on slide page six or eight, what does it say? Page eight of the package, right? Page eight of the package. I'd just like to get, as we go into our discussions for March 7th, that that page right there. Can, I'd like the finance committee to give us their their recommendations. Why, why, those, why those values for road reserves, capital improvement projects, and repair and replacement. I, I think that's an important, piece of information that we would we should have as we go into our discussions. I'm, so I'm asking Claude and the finance committee if you can give us some 
some <clears throat> some additional support behind behind those values. Well, um, excuse me. The, yeah, there was no like uh, deep uh, deep calculations to come up with those. Uh, it was just sort of like a, an overall again, you know, um, maybe a ten thousand foot uh, view of it to see how it would unfold down the road uh, with our estimate, guesstimated, I would say, um, expenditures in like ro uh, road reserve, um, uh, repair and maintenance. So it's just sort of like broad brush strokes to see what it, you know, uh, how we can contribute to these funds um, in a way that doesn't, um, it, it's a balance. So we don't want to increase because you can see that it impacts the um, uh, the assessments directly, but we don't want to you know hugely impact the uh, the assessments in any one year, and we don't want to not um, um, I guess allow for it. Whereas down the road, then we would have to take that big hit. So it's just it's, it, it's like a balancing act. So it was no, you know, specific numbers that were calculated. I would add to that that we do schedule in the summertime a review of the reserve study, and we did have a meeting where we discussed and reviewed some of the items and on the different funds. Um, and then at the review in January, it was a little more summarized. The discussion was more summarized. If I can go back, because because I I pulled up the notes from that. From that meeting and i'll go through the cip for instance in the cip i think allowing for the things that the board had talked about that we knew were at least in discussion pickleball courts other things like that um and and knowing how much we as renee presented earlier is, is left available i think <clears throat> as i recall um the committee said that while in the past year we've we've allocated a million this year, we this to this year's budget, a million dollars is allocated. They felt because we're entering the year with a million left, with with not a large list of projects for CIP, that a half a million dollars was sufficient. So I understand that one, right? Does that sound right, to everybody? Okay. Um, what I don't, what I just would like a little more clarification on is, is the repair and replacement, because I know that in the past we've kind of done two million, and here we're we, it got raised to two point seven seven five, um, and. If there's some more clarification on that, real quick, that would be helpful. Dale had his hand up, and I think he wanted to talk about that specifically. We're going to talk about that. Are you okay with that? Love. It. All right. So Dale Welty is part of our finance committee. Plus, he's lived here a very long time. Everybody get that? <laughs> Three, two. Uh, just a comment. Uh, I want to kind of go back to dredging for a minute. And I, I know we talk about pulling the money and I was on the dredge committee and many other committees and Lejoie. And uh, we, the basic idea or the basic thing we know is that the, about, the lake has filled up about with about half the sediment. And then, let me start all over. Uh, from the original volume of the lake, about half of it is now sediment. So we do have a problem. There's sediment coming into the lake and we know it's coming in. The last study was done in two bath and severe study was done in 2014. And that's when they determined how much the depth of the water is and how much the depth of the sediment is. So in that 80 year period, we have an idea what was happening, but we really don't know what's happening today, so to speak, because we, you know, the, we've had uh, housing developments, we've had settlement ponds, we've had a lot of different things change in the character of the community. So what I'm trying to move ahead with on the Lejwa side is basically let's do another study in, in 2024 and let's see what's happened in the last in the last 10 years. So from there we can kind of model what's going to happen to the lake. But the basic idea that the sediment's coming in, half the lake is now sediment is a problem. And I think by saying, oh well, we can't dredge, so we shouldn't reserve for a problem, doesn't do anything about the basic problem, which is the sediment still coming in. We know that the PFAS has created an incredible problem with hauling the, hauling the soil away. But at some point, if the lake's full of sediment, we've got to do something, which is most likely dredge, and we're just going to have to pay the big money to get the PFAS addressed. And, and we don't know when that date is. It could be 10 years from now, 15, 20 years from now. So we don't really know. We're hoping this next study will we'll be able to graph out some predictions on this. 
So the, the point is we still have a problem. We, we really don't know the solution. It's still gonna cost us money. So when we talk about 2.3 million or whatever it was, and we think, wow, we can dredge that lake for $2.3 million. We should step right up and do it and blah, 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 blah. That, that money was 2.3, wasn't really the idea that we were going to use, you'd have that money to dredge the lake. It, it was that we were gonna try to go get grants from the state and the federal government. And a lot of these grants require matching funds. And so we were hoping to, to get an $8 million grant and get some, our $2 million be matching funds. So we would be leveraging that $2 million uh, to a much higher level. And of course we have EVMWD who has their, their responsibilities for the lake. But the, the issue is, and it's not a problem, but the issue is, is they're concerned with the water quality. They're concerned with the ability to get drinking water out of the lake. They're, they don't feel comfortable taking ratepayers' money from Wildemar and Elsinore and using it to fund our lake to make it recreational available when their communities can't come and use it, right? So their, their point is they will do what it takes to keep that lake safe for drinking water. At some point in the future, that lake water level is gonna get pretty low. It's gonna heat up, potential for uh, nutrition's and nutrition levels to get high and algae blooms to occur, evaporation rates can change. And at some point there's gonna be a tipping point where that lake becomes far less useful, far less beneficial. So we're hoping to kind of graph that out in the next couple of years to give a picture. And, and I, and, with, and the two, 2007, 2008 wasn't really an idea that it was going to be done. Like you say, it's, it's, a, it's a guide. It wasn't that it was going to be done in 2007 or eight. It's that the, if the grant, if all of a sudden the state came up with 10 grand or 10 million, and we needed 2 million to tip it over and do the project, we wanted to make sure we had that 2 million reserved so that we could get the dredging down. Now we add PFAS in, which is this unpredictable feature to dredging. And we don't really know what it's going to cause. At least I don't know. Maybe somebody does. We don't know what it's going to do to cause problems for dredging, but I'm pretty sure it's going to cause big problems. So uh, I'm just hesitant. I, I, you know, I wouldn't feel bad about moving it out to 2020 or 22 because you know we could move it forward. And I agree, it's not going to happen in the next two years. But I think taking it off as a line item, I think it's a problem. Um, it's just just a they kind of fall to the wayside when they come off. So that's just my comment on that. And then as far as the re repair and replacement reserves, we I think it was last year we were scheduled to spend about four hundred fifty thousand dollars, and instead this year we're spending kind of close to three million between the lodge. We're talking now the uh, the median. So now we're we're pulling out a lot more money than we originally was in the in the study. I don't want to say it's a plan. The study is not a plan. The study is a a, a financial guide to make decisions. So the fact that you go and say, we don't want to necessarily, you're not supposed to follow the guide to the T. I think you've kind of said that. And I agree hundred percent. It's a guide for spending. It's a model for spending, but because we've kind of deviated kind of radically from that model that was laid out, my feeling on the finance committee is that we needed to make sure that we did an offset because if we spent say two and a half million more than was anticipated, we felt that three quarters of a million would bring us somewhere in line. And we're, we're a little concerned because the reserve study needs to be done next year. And if we came out to the reserve study and the reserve study indicated we were very underfunded in our reserves, it, we just didn't think it would go well in the report. So if it came out in our percentage had dropped from 60 to 45, we were just uncomfortable and felt that there should be a little cushion. That was the logic behind that 2075, uh, 2775. Uh, the roads, I think, is all basic. I mean, you're modeling. You, we're not going to talk about nineteen thousand for an hour, right? No, excuse me, nineteen nineteen thousand uh, dollars. And capital improvements had a similar vein, so I agree with that. But I just think the cut the repair and reserve at this time, uh, it's a risk. Uh, I, I felt that that was the bottom line risk of those numbers up there, and beyond that, I was starting to get very uncomfortable with how much you know income we were, or how much reserves we're going to lose because. Those reserves, why they're designated for their roads and capital improvement and repair and replacement. In a financial crisis in the community, we can borrow from those funds to cover our expenses. And so that is also part of the bigger picture reserve study. Uh, Susan, what do we got? At the end of the year, we have like 1.6 million at the end of the most fiscal years and in, in, the, in the bank, basically non-reserve. Expenditures? Or and at the end of the year, uh, we usually have like one point what one point six million dollar in the bank that's kind of in our cash reserves. So our cash reserves is one point six million, which is about a month's worth of expenses, right? And if you're a household and and all the money you had in the bank was your one month's payments, 
that's a little stressful, okay? And that's, we have a very, a fairly stable income, so it isn't terrible, but that's what we have, 1.6. Well, part of the reserve structure of our community is that we have these funds that we can borrow against and adjust money from, so that in case things do get kind of deep and dark, we have this short-term fixes that'll help us carry through some, some crises. So I, on the big picture, I don't like to see the reserves go into such a level of risk that it, it weakens the whole community. And, and I just think those numbers are the bottom end of what I'm comfortable with. Sorry for rambling. So I appreciate that. One of the things um, from, the, from the dredging perspective, and this is just from conversations I have with Darcy Burke, because mm -hmm. she's working on a lot of different things with the upper level or higher level of government to um, try to get things, I don't wanna, I wanna be real careful what I say, uh, where we may not have to dredge to have a constant water flow coming into Canyon Lake. And it's one thing and she, you know, she's great to remind me of this too, is, and you pointed it out, it is their lake. We just lease the surface rights. Right. This year we're paying a little bit over $1.7 million to the water districts, just so we can use the surface rights of the lake, which I appreciate that we get to use that. So they have the, they make the ultimate decision on what can be done. And it is first and foremost, as she points out, it is a drinking water reservoir. So anything that we may want to kind of shore or to have it a little bit deeper, they make the final decision. And that's why when I mentioned dredging to her, it wasn't even something that would be of consideration at this time. That's why I felt comfortable. And if and if it's something where that might happen in 20, 30 years from now, as you were saying, then maybe a separate reserve fund, if a board wants to approve it, similar to a separate road reserve. So then that way everyone can see how that's tracking. And that could be a great what if, you know, if there's an opportunity to do that. Um, and if Elsinore Valley says, yeah, we'll go ahead and let you do that, um, dredge the lake then that could be set up that way versus having it part of all the components that we absolutely, or that we own. Yeah, it's a very complex. I, you and I could talk for a long time and, we, and what we would do is keep bringing up more elements, more complexities, yeah, yeah. and then again, build on the complexities. There's no doubt all those complexities exist and the ones you point out are, are pretty valid. Uh, but again, in the end, the simple answer, at some point we're gonna have to deal with the height of the sediment. The, the, the closing of the plants is, gives, gives us a couple of free years recreation-wise. Getting to the steady uh, flow of water will give us a couple of years. But at the end of the day, something that has to be done, done with the sediment. And it would be nice to have at least some base level of, of reserves in place for that. And I'm not, I'm not, no, let's get 10 million or 20. No, I'm, not talk, I'm just talking, right. you know, a reserve line with something that has some credibility. All right. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna ask for, okay, yeah, one second. So no other questions from me? Okay, so now we're gonna go on to, <clears throat> I gotta first ask if there's any member comments. Oh, do, about the reserves? Sorry, Joe. Oh, come on up, sorry, my apologies. Um, I wanna speak for your benefit. Joe Washley, 37, 16, 433. Uh, <clears throat> it's so difficult to read these numbers from back here, okay? And I just wanted to clarify a few items. We started out tonight and we said we're uh, 7.8 was our, is our increase. That 7.8 is simply in the operating budget. The operating budget is going up 990 some odd thousand dollars, and it is 7.8. But, and on our reserves, well, let me go back a second. The bottom line is we're recommending $15 a month increase. Now, that $15 a month increase works out to a 5% increase in the dues uh, for the year. If the board accepts what the finance committee recommends uh, with inflation being at eight and around 8% 8 
you can understand that a 5% increase as we've worked very hard to keep that down. Now on the reserves, the reserves that we're, we're asking for that are up there, in case you can't read it, it's two, uh, the uh, repair and replacement, 2,775,000. Uh, road reserves, 2 million, um, actually 2 million <laughs> uh, and 19,000. And there's 500,000 in the uh, new, new things that we're doing to see. CIP, which is an increase from last year of 5.1. And uh, our biggest concern, it was the repair and replacement reserve because you wanna keep it up uh, well over 30%. If it goes down to 30%, we're all in trouble because realtors have told me they would have to have somebody sign a new and you know somebody's they're showing houses to uh assign something that says that canyon lake has poor reserves or the reserves are rated as poor so we really work towards that and that's why we put so much into the repair and replacement because we're taking out 2.5 now for the lodge and we just took out six hundred and thirty thousand. Uh, out of that for the median when you come in the gate, et cetera. So overall, we're talking about a $15 increase, which is a 5% increase. I hope that flares up any of the things there. I do want to make one comment. I think Dale is totally correct that we shouldn't be fooling around with trying to take things like the dredging out of the, the budget. We review it at the time of the budget. The people, they're going to do another budget review, I believe, um, this coming year, uh, in this, this coming May, June, or sometime like that. And we sure as heck, uh, we, we just can't play games, uh, in my opinion, with any of the reserve items. So that's really all I had to say. I just wanted to make sure People understood we're not talking about raising due 7.8%. We're holding it at five. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And I'll, I want to make one comment to that. Um, I don't see it for the dredge specifically as playing games with the numbers since it's something that in 2027, we're not going to be spending that money. Um, so, and as Dale said, it could be pushed out even further. I also want to point out that if we look back, and it's in the older budget books, if we look back to the last reserve analysis that was done back in 2018 or prior to the 2021, it had 800000 allocated for dredging the lake to be spent in the year 2036. So it made a difference when in the 2021 reserve, it was bumped up to 2027 and also increased to 2 million. And that's one of the things that I found most notable when I was going through everything. And I'm going to um, work and find out whether I'm on the board or not to make certain that future boards, when there are big decisions like that, that it's made an open session um, and this might have been, but I just want to make certain because when you play around with the reserves and you add items or you increase the cost of the items, it certainly impacts the percentage funded. And right now it shows, you know, it goes back, I'll go back to the irrigation system because we spent that money on the irrigation system that impacted the amount in the reserves. So instead of at a 60% model, we're at 45 but I wouldn't change that. I think the board made an excellent decision in moving forward and in having the irrigation system done at the golf course. Um, and I, the, the last thing I wanna add too is while the money sits in there year over year, we earn a little bit, we, do, we're, we don't even keep pace with inflation. So when we're funding at 60%, um, we're still continuing to lose money year over year. That's why for me personally, I'm not speaking at all on behalf of this board, but a 45% on 
on a POA that has over 1,000 components seems to make good financial sense. But I agree with you, you never want to get even close to 30. I remember Dale and Ed mentioning that they used to have to encourage prior boards to be above 30, and that just sounded frightening, the battles that they had to be in for that one. Um, so I just wanted to chat about or address that. Go ahead and close. Just a quick, just a quick question. So, what is our percent coverage right now, according to the uh, software? Forty-five percent. That is that assumes that that assumes that we will spend the full. I think it's up there two million that's allocated for this year, and we're not even on track for that. There's items that haven't that don't need to be replaced at this time, so they keep getting pushed forward. So again, the la the items last year got pushed forward into this year and that'll continue to go until something has to be replaced. And then the other thing I'll just point out that's also in there as well, and it's on there um, and it got pushed forward uh, thanks to the amazing work of Brightview on the golf course and probably TWG, but there's a fairway refurbishment in there. And, and that's projected in 10 years that for each uh, two different phases, one and two, that 1.3 million will be spent. And I love one of the comments and they said, as long as Mark and Brightview continue to take the excellent care of the golf course, we won't have to spend that money. I think it's important that we do keep that in there because if it ever comes time where and we, I think we were getting closer to it without this rainfall, um, but if Governor Newsom or whoever's a governor at that time shuts it off and says, you cannot water your golf courses, and we're getting dangerously close to that, um, then that fairway refurbishment could happen simply not because of the, any of the, anything that we could do, but because of what the governor has said from a water perspective. So that's something that I don't think we should mess with, but those are items that can get pushed out if things are looking well. Thank you. Um, though I'm on the finance committee, I'm here as an independent member. I'm not representing the finance committee in what I say next. 3868229. This is on, isn't it? Okay. A couple things. I'm an engineer by trade. How many of us here are marine engineers? Show of hands. Anybody here a marine engineer? We can't make decisions about what we're going to do with our lake without having the experts weigh in. Anything that was expressed here is an armchair quarterback expression of an opinion that is not backed by trade. I've had many conversations with Darcy, and I think there are many options that are available to us beyond dredging. But since I'm not a marine engineer, I'm not going to express an opinion on that. I don't think we should make that decision until we have the informed opinions. The other thing is, I'm right to the point, my wife and I are investors. 61% is the average reserve level. We invest in property. And guess what we look at? What's your reserve level? So, Eric, love it. You found somebody that we have confidence in to go calculate our reserve levels. I heard you personally vouch for them. You're happy with them. And they came back with 60%. After we make these trade-offs for this year, we're going to be at 45%. I wouldn't invest in a property at 45% as an individual investor. This will impact all of our house values when we try to sell. Because anybody with the brain that's spending a million dollars on a property is going to look at this and go, what? What? You were at 60% and now you're at 45? What's your plan to get back to 60? Because 45 is dangerously close to 30. And it's been brought up and it's well known in the industry. Anybody here who's owned investment properties knows that's dangerous. So sorry if that was emotional. I'm not a member of the finance committee in this moment. I'm a resident. Thank you for your time. So I will tell you, just, just so you know, we are without any re renovation, we are at 45. So I, I just want you to know, and, and I will gladly sit with you and show you on the software. And that assumes again, that we're gonna spend, this is showing in that budget book, 
that's anticipating that we're going to spend 2.78 million this year, which we're not. But according to this, this also assumes, again, this is a funding scenario. This is just one scenario. And if you take a look at this, this shows trying to achieve 60% in 10 years. The other thing it also shows, and I think this is important for everyone, if you want to follow this model in the year 2031 or going from year 2030 to 2031, there's an increase in the monthly contribution from 38.59 to 61.69. I don't think any board wants that to happen. So again, this is just a scenario that was put in there because the reserve team was suggesting to the board at the time that having a 60% would be a good idea or being at that 60%. And in order to maintain that, then, you know, the prior board shouldn't have made decisions that they did for certain things. And we should have to follow this like a Bible. And if an HVAC system goes out, then you don't replace it until it shows up on this. So I just want you to know whoever's on the board to maintain a static 60 is not going to be, well, they can, and the dues are going to fluctuate or things might start to fall apart. So then it comes down to, would you rather have, and again, we are different than other POAs and it's a philosophy difference. And I get that. Um, but you can either be a community at 60% with a lot of amenities that are just aging. You know, we could still pick up the furniture in the lodge. We could still lose a lot of money on water by not redoing that irrigation system sooner than it should have been done. Or we can be a community that's in the 40 to 45% range and have everything just up to date and beautiful. So I know it's, it's different philosophies and, you know, I know some people submitted, you know, that's why it's a great time for people to consider running for the board as well. It's a great time. So next comment, member comments, board member comments. Oh, hi, Travis. Come on up, Travis. Travis Montgomery, 3863-010. Uh, first, I wanna thank the budget committee. Uh, as indicated, they've been extremely diligent diligent and pretty well informed after meeting with all the departments and uh, going through these budget issues probably in more detail than anybody else in the community has and that's what it takes um, and i'm also pleased that they're recommending an overall five percent increase i think that's reasonable when i was on this board years ago i said we should have some kind of a minimal dues increase every year other costs are going up all along. And if you look at what our cost of living is, has been in the past year, um, those of us who are on social security know we got an eight and a half percent increase in our social security, just because of the fact that costs have gone up. So for us to say we can go up 5%, uh, you know, I think is incredible. Um, a couple of people that I've heard speak this evening, uh, more as individuals than members of the finance committee have made a lot of sense. Um, a lot of study has been done by the finance committee. And I hope, you know, that's one of the things we has been mentioned a couple times tonight is study. Uh, if you want to do something with the lake reserve, study it. If you want to do something with the golf course reserve, study them, find out about it. Don't go off. Uh, half cocked and, and make decisions before it's really had an opportunity to do it. Um, we can go with what the finance committee, who I would call the pseudo experts, experts on our budget uh, this year and have a 5% increase. And that's great uh, with only having a 5% increase, $15 a month uh, basically is what that is. Um, Okay, there's a, an old saying, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And, and things are going pretty good right now. Um, so I, I think that's good. Um, I did have one question in, or a comment on something that Susan said that uh, they were increasing fees in the accounting department or issue, for issues there. And if I heard it right, one of the reasons was to offset the reduced income because of less house sales and things like that. Well, what about reducing the costs 
in that department. Uh, if we're having less sales and less revenue, don't you reduce the cost some and not necessarily uh, raise the fees so that you can keep all those numbers of employees or whatever they are. Um, your cost can't be going up too much uh, if you're not having the income and not do, having to work on the project. So I raise that as a, as a question for you. Uh, it, it, it hit me right off the bat that we're raising fees because we have we less less business, we got less business, we, you know, it's, it's not the kind of thing where you go out and hire more salesmen and you can do more. Uh, it's driven by what the real estate market is more than it is driven by anything you can do internally or the organization can do. Um, I was on the board in, right after a major, major revenue increase in dues in 2005, it cost a couple board members their jobs. But that was the first year that they started funding the road reserve at $2 million a year. Nothing had been done for years. Um, back in those days, the roads were in a lot worse shape than they are now. One reason was because we were a growing community and you'd had lots and lots of construction trucks driving on our roads over 15, 20, 30 years up to that period of time that really tore the heck out of the road system. So, you know, um, Eric mentioned phase one of the road re repair. Phase one of the road repair was really in 2007 when we went from vacation down to uh, Santa Maria and, and did, and some of that was done shoddy. And now you're coming back with new phase ones to repair the, the old phase ones and twos. But uh, yeah, the new phase, right. But, it, but it's good that we have the reserve funds there, <laughs> excuse me, uh, to do that with. and. Um, I, I strongly agree with the fact that we shouldn't go below 45% or so in our, in our reserves. Uh, nothing wrong with having a little extra money in the bank. And if we hold that, those reserve funds for the, uh, for the dredge aside for a while, that's fine. You know, there's, a, there's other things that on the lake that may need done. Um, and I, d I don't know that a constant water flow is going to help the shallowness of some of the people who live on the East Bay who can hardly get their boats out, uh, you can't raise it that high to solve all those issues. Um, I was in draw, involved in dredging for many years with the Port of Long Beach who testified many times before Congress on dredging funds. There's ways to do things with sediment and take care of them and it costs a lot of money. And as Dale was saying, you know, if we just have some seed money in there, almost everything that you look for anymore wants some matching grants. So. You know, let's keep that seed there so that when the chip, when the opportunities are there, uh, we can do that. Um, that's that I think pretty much what I all I want to say. I just commend you for staying at five percent. I would encourage the board to listen strongly to the people that have spent the whole year. That's all they do during the year, and the board works very hard. But the board's looking at other things all the time and can't depend. Uh, you know, necessarily become experts on the day-to-day -day operation financially, but that's all the finance committee does is work on on finances. So I would yield a lot of uh, consideration to their recommendations, and I'm really pleased that it came out at five percent. We got, uh, you know, the seven point eight percent is just operating expense increases, which I think yeah. is very good uh, under the current financial. Uh, situation. And I don't know how many of us in our homes have been able to keep our increase this past year down Travis. to 7.8%. Uh, if you are, you're not buying meat and eggs. Travis, thank you so much. We went extra. Hi, Jeannie. Uh, come on up. Jeannie O'Dell, 3868458. And did you I, recently pick up paperwork? What's that? Did you recently pick up some paperwork? I did, maybe. Thank you. Um, just real quick on the fee schedule, because we didn't really touch base on some of the increases. And I noticed for the lodge, for the front lawn, it's increasing from 250 to 400, which is great because when the exterior patio renovation was presented, it said that we would increase, have the potential for increasing fees for the use of the lawn. But what I don't see is what the non-member fees are gonna be for the 
lawn area. Just like the golf course, it, it has non-member fees. So I was curious why for the fee schedule, we wouldn't have non-member fees for the lawn. So that's all. That was, I think, I guess for you, Lynn, more than anything, just might be something you want to consider did you, adding. Did you want to answer? Can answer, yes. Um, so a few years back, the board at the time took out the non-member rates out of the budget book because they're non-member rates and the budget book is a member budget book. Um, it's not been, it's been the same rate because the majority of the reservations are members or sponsored guests. Um, so we haven't, we had a non-member rate for the Holiday Bay Room, but we didn't have a separate rate for that. And we didn't increase it. And to clarify on the lawn, we have not presented a revised fee schedule for the lawn area because there's a dining area and the, um, the I don't want to say trellis, the stage area that we'll call it for the ceremonies um, that we need to present to the board for the fee schedule. So when we built the fee schedule, this was prior to that project being presented to the board for approval. So we based it based on what we currently had and did not include those additionals, but we did include an increase, if that makes sense. And I understand for the Holiday Bay Room, that's not an issue. I'm just saying like the golf course has non-member right. rates published and you just said it was an interior book, but it's still published for non-member rates. I understand it. It was just at the time the prior board took it out of the budget book. <laughs> gotcha. Just thinking you might want to- And if the board would like to add that, include that back in. Yeah. One of the things that, that was exciting about the patio is it was a mention that we could have more outside events taking place for, the, for a higher rate. So thought you might want to consider that. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank much. you, Jeannie. That's an excellent idea. Because non-members should have to pay more than members. Outside. Uh, yes. And that's its own separate conversation. I don't want to belabor the whole meeting with that. <laughs> oh, wait, but wait, but there's my own. No, don't start until you come. No, so you have to sit down. Who are you, young man? First thing I have to say is when you sign up to give a discussion, you should take a priority where people raise their hands. Thank you. You didn't announce me. So to clarify, we've been doing discussion on the board discussion items. I'm for, sorry? We've been doing member comments on the board discussion items. We haven't gotten to the actual member. member comment regarding the budget. I understand, sir, that we just haven't gotten the technical. Anyway, I just, you know, it's a joke. Ed Dujek, 3868-206. I came to speak to the board about the two most important revenue generating items, both the restaurant and the golf course. This year, the restaurants are projecting an increase of $500,000 or total sales of $4 million, but they project a loss of 400,000 down from this year's projected loss of 576. At that rate, we'll have to do $5 million in sales in the restaurants in order just to break even. But before some facts you should consider, the lodge is basically two restaurants with the bar doing the bar restaurant area doing 60 to 70% of the business on weekdays. The lodge has basically one person area to serve two restaurants. Therefore, before opening an additional outside restaurant, will require a redesign of the bar, which I don't know whether it's in town or not. When either facility does between $4,000 and $6,000 nightly, it takes three to four extra people at the lodge compared to the country club to do that business. And if we add a third restaurant, which would be the outside facility, it will require addition, addition, more additional people. Therefore, if revenue does not increase dramatically, we will see a significant loss. Finally, we have not checked the competitive pricing of Costco commercial and restaurant depot in order to reduce food prices, which have that when it went two percent this year, probably because of inflation. The golf courses are projecting a hundred and fifty thousand dollar increase in total sales with a one million four hundred thousand dollar total generating and generating a loss of $809,000. In order to improve the lack of revenue, it appears that a lack of sufficient goal carts is the problem. The golf carts are provided by the golf pro at no cost to the POA, but he needs the facilities of the house and a plan to make their usage. 
As a result of this, we have 100, we have 50 outside members who cannot participate, at, which is a cost of which is costing the POA $150,000. We cannot enlarge the tournaments in order to increase additional revenues. I'm not blaming the department managers for this loss of almost $1.2 million or a cost of $240 per tenant. The job of the managers is to run the operations. Therefore, and we have a tremendous amount of business talent in the committees. Therefore, I believe the board should immediately appoint a committee either through finance, facilities, or golf with the assistance of the department managers to develop a business plan within two months that covers marketing, additional expenditures, labor costs for the above departments in order to improve profitability. Upon receipt of the plan, the board should immediately review them and if approved, expedite immediate implementation, particularly additional costs. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Any other member? Do you have any member comments? Okay. But for budget? Okay, come on. Hi, Kathy Lekowa. I'm at 3778-008. I just really had a question. Um, I think, Susan, you mentioned that the fire department sale, we have to include the budget for the capital gain tax, but yet we don't get the, the profit from the sale at our budget. Where does that money go? The, the operating budget basically uh, is, is the, the amenity revenue minus the operating expenses for the POA. There's a line item that goes underneath that on the profit and loss statement. If you look at it, it would go down with the depreciation. So it's not in the operating budget. It's a below the line object um, amount. So it's not part of fund accounting. It, it's underneath the operating budget. It's not part of the, it doesn't, it won't subtract from the assessment revenue and the calculation of the operating budget. It's just, I it's get an that accounting it's, thing. Yeah, yeah, but I get that it's not, but where does it go? But your question about where does it go? You know what, can we bring up that other, my other slide? Because we didn't get to the fire cell, fire station cell to the end. The fire cell, oh my gosh, right? <laughs> so next one. So um, this, and they can make it. This just to let you know. So the city offered to purchase the fire station for 1.39 million. Our net proceeds will be a minimum of 1.112. And um, and you can see here, uh, we went back, one of our staff who did mm -hmm. incredible research to try to figure out what our basis is in the property. And Susan, who's also, who is a CPA, is working with our tax advisors and other CPAs to see how much um, is our actual basis. So if you scroll all the way down below, you can see that our basis in the property is 208000 Now, whether our tax advisors are going to let us do that is a whole other story that Susan, or when they are finished, can comment to when it's all done. But I just wanted you to see the history of the contributions from the POA and the member, well, the members through the POA and the boards to the fire station. So the question at the very bottom, it says member suggestions. Okay. Because this is money we did not plan on. We haven't even talked about. So we are asking members and, you know, as we get more of a timeline, we really want members to give input on what we should do with this money. I heard one member say to me, he said, well, it should go to capital improvements just to improve the overall community. Some people from Galt Field might have some other ideas, but we are looking for members to give their suggestions because again, we haven't, we didn't know it was coming. Uh, we haven't talked about it. We haven't planned on it. I don't have any like the best idea, um, but I think the best ideas are going to come from the members. So if you have any suggestions now, or if you want to think of some and email the board and it might be where it gets separated or, or you know, certainly some of it will be carved out to pay for the taxes. Um, and that's why we're seeing the 1.1 net. Uh, but we'd love to hear from the members on what we should do with that money. 
Okay, so with the concern of the reserves, I guess one option would be, or could it be to replenish some of the reserves if we felt we were dangerously low or approaching low? Is that an option with that? Every option's on the table. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, every option's on the table. And I did wanna say that it would clarify if I could bring up the profit and loss statement right now, I could show you how that that would fall in there. Maybe after the meeting, if you want further discussion. Uh, well, let us do this first, but then yes, because I want to hear everyone's comments on that. So let's go to member comments. So these are non-financial member comments. All right. Madam President, we'd like to call up Dave Martillo, please. Check, check, one, two. All right, we're in. Okay, uh, a couple of things. I was asked to come here uh, a couple of minutes ago regarding uh, tennis. I, I, I guess on the agenda is maybe a line item on the tennis pro. Um, my wife and I moved here almost 18 years ago, and it was primarily over all the amenities that we have offered here, and one of them was tennis. And the big part of the tennis was the fact that we had a tennis pro that could organize all the events and teach our kids what to do and how to do it. Uh, I'm a beneficiary of having three kids going through all the junior programs there. Um, they've gone on to play it at the high school level. They all went on to play in, at the CIF level. So I'm very proud to say that uh, I don't think they would have done that if they didn't have the opportunities that were provided here by the tennis programs provided by the tennis club. So I just wanna kind of make note of that if I could. And if I have an extra couple of minutes and I didn't put it on my agenda, but, uh, but I, I'll, I swim, uh, try to get in the pool seven days a week and our pool is not open three months out of the year. And I find myself over at the gym down the street in Murrieta, along with a lot of other Canyon Lakers. Um, I know there's a lot of ways you can, I, I, mean, well, I think we should consider the pool as an amenity, just like we consider tennis and a lot of the things that are, are not profit driven and they're not they're making money by selling the, the cookies at the pool and, and the swim lessons. But it's one that if, if we're open year round, I think you could find an, a, a, a reason to keep it open year round. Um, like I said, we're all counting the days to see it open up on March 15th or 13th. And do we need new pool deck equipment and all that stuff? I don't know. And that's not my agenda, but I would love to swim in my own pool in my own backyard uh, 12 months out of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Is there another one? Madam President, we have Matt Williams. <laughs> Keep it short. Joe Travis from Fairgrounds Montgomery. Uh, it, it, it's been, you know, I, I know you guys, right? Remember? Oh, of course. Of course you do. Go ahead and so, have a seat, please. No, no, I will not. I'll, I, I will, I'll keep it really, really short. I wasn't expected to speak. I think I was kind of plugged into this. Uh, my, my child's been playing tennis for 11, 12 years here in Canyon Lake, and it's been a, it's been a pleasure. So I'm sorry I wasn't expected to speak. But with respect, and thank you so much. And thank you. Is there another one? Madam President, Ed Diziak, did you want to come up and speak again? Are you good? Okay. You could okay. have done it again, Ed. <laughs> we'll move on to Tammy Kennedy. Three eight zero four two four seven, um, Tammy Kennedy. I also am going to discuss tennis. Um, don't know what the plan is, and um, we we have a small community here. Been here almost. What have I been here? Thirty five years. I'm going on. Um, so I consider that most of my life. Raised my kids here. Um, I didn't start playing tennis until I was in my late forties. 
So I haven't had a longevity in the tennis, but I started playing for my health. And I got my kids involved in tennis even after I was involved in it. Um, got my grandkids involved in tennis. And I agree with Dave Martella. Um, one of the things that I know in Canyon Lake is that we have a lot of children. With those children, we have a lot of um, crazy times. We see them at the tennis courts. We see them causing havoc. We go out and invite those kids a lot. We invite them to come and play tennis. We invite them to get involved in the tennis programs so that they aren't creating havoc out there. So one of, one of the, um, um, let me back up here. Um, as far as having a tennis pro, I don't know if that's a big deal to you guys. I don't know what the discussion is about that, but it's been brought up in our tennis meetings. So I wanted to clarify that um, as not only a member of Canyon Lake as a tennis player, that's a minute area of expense. And I think it's a very important one. So I'd like you guys to approach that as though we see it and it's important to us. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Okay, our next uh, member will be Matt Boyan, I think is how you say the last name. Thank you. Hi, Matt Boyan, 3869041. And I'll keep it brief. Same uh, comments that were previously made, and it's for support of the tennis pro, if that's into consideration in eliminating that position or not. And I think the remarks have already been made, but uh, the juniors program, the USTA tennis um, tournament that's coming up, I think it was supposed to be this Saturday. Obviously, it's probably going to get canceled because of the rain. But I think it's just a great asset for not a lot of expenditure to the POA and obviously the members of this community and a, a lot of the reason why people have moved here. It's one of those benefits that obviously probably doesn't break even like the golf course, the lodge and everything else, but minimal expense, great benefit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, and our last one will be Josh Easterly. Hi there, Josh Easterly. Uh, not sure tracking a lot. It's 30475 Seahorse Circle. Yeah. So I'm actually here to support the tennis as well. I think they pretty much covered most of the stuff I wanted to speak about. Um, the only issue that I see that they didn't bring up is that prior to having a tennis pro, there was really never a strong program as far as tournaments went, the junior tournaments, the USTA, et cetera. So I think having a tennis pro in there gives it a form like more of a formal arrangement someone that actually can organize it keep it going make it happen um seems like a pretty invaluable position to me and i'm not sure what the board thinks but that's my opinion and hopefully we can keep it going that's it. thank you for sharing your opinion appreciate that no more member comments all right so now we're going to go to well i already have Jeannie who raised her hand first, but then we'll go. Um, so this could still be about anything related to financials, but certainly looking for suggestions. I think Jeannie has a suggestion. And the proceeds, here she comes. Jeannie O'Dell, 3868458. I would like to recommend that the funds from the sale of the fire station, the 1.1 or whatever it ends up to be, be placed into the road reserve project or the road reserve fund. I feel that that's the proper fund because that money is spent for the entire, the good of the entire community, not, you know, select the amenities. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Good evening, Tad Friesmeyer, 3863-329. I just had a couple of questions here uh, regarding capital gains on the fire station. If I heard that correctly, why would the POA have to pay capital gains on a property that's been in the community for such a long time? Um, this is my second meeting. So pardon my ignorance um, regarding the solar project. Is the solar project purchased or leased? Um, if the solar project is leased, who's receiving the tax credits and or rebates for the solar project? 
also if leased, was a lien placed on the POA and or any property that the POA owns. Um, my last meeting was in regards to the equestrian center on uh, our financial plan here. Um, it states that uh, marketing price plus or market price plus handling for feed uh, shows it was approved. Maybe this was printed prior to all of that. But I just want to confirm that it was voted no and all that. So thank you guys and have a great evening. All right. Do you want to answer the question on capital gains and the most no unless you want to answer on capital gains we'll let susan do that and then we'll go to the the sale of a poa property is in fact a taxable event and because we don't have much basis in the property i.e cost that we have contributed to the property the bulk of that um, revenue will be taxable and the capital gains tax rate that the POA falls into is 20%. And then real quickly, just to address your questions on the solar, um, the, the solar arrangement is a power purchase agreement. Basically, they're building a $2 million system for us. Uh, we agree to buy power from them at 18 cents a kilowatt fixed for the next 25 years. And there is a, they, they have an easement on our property because it is their... Um, it's their structure until we buy buy it out from them after the 25th year. Uh, I would say so, yes. It kind of depends on solar technology. What are the cost of panels? Or at that point, it might just be, hey, we'll keep the shade and we'll just buy the structures from you. So, sure. It's a right. In this case, in this case, we're not leasing it. It's a power purchase agreement, and and rather than a lien, it's an easement until we buy this the the structure from them at the end of the agreement. They own the power plant until we we buy them out at the end. Any other member comments? I see a hand raised in the back. Come on up. Okay. Um, just curious, why are we selling the fire department? I mean, the fire station. They offered to purchase it from us. I'm gonna go down the whole story. Lease it back to us, rent it back to us. Uh, I mean, okay, I've been here a long time. We could have bought the lake. I almost could have bought the lake. I mean, I look at that and I think to myself, okay, now we don't own the lake and we're renting it back. Okay, we're leasing it back. We own the fire station. Now we give up the fire station. We're gonna rent it back. I mean, what are we gonna do? Is that something that's going to happen? Because I'd like to know. Well, let me go back to the lake because one of the, I think we heard from that the lake, they, we didn't, they got it through eminent domain. So there wasn't an option, at least from what I've been told mm -hmm. like when, when they got the lake, or at least when, when the lake was no longer with us, it was through eminent domain. So I'll go through the whole history. Are you guys ready? It's going to go off of memory because I don't have it all in front of me. Um, so we have been leasing the fire station. Um, we had lease agreements. I think it went back to 1985 and it was a dollar a year. Um, and then there was a 120 day mutual termination. And that's when it was with the county. Um, and then eventually the city, we entered into an agreement with them, I believe in 2016. I apologize, my numbers. So again, I don't have it in front of me, but we entered into an agreement with them. And um, that was a dollar a year on a 60 day mutual termination. And that was every two years they were renewed. They renewed in 2018, it might, have, it might be 2017, 2019, then it came to 2021. And in 2021, we sent them the lease agreement, same terms as everything. We just changed the dates and we heard nothing back. 
And then in the beginning of 2022, um, I think it was around March of 2022, we received a, a amended lease agreement from the city and what they wanted the board to do at that time, or was it 2021? Yeah, 2022, it was under July. Okay, 2022, sorry. Um, is they wanted the board to enter into a 50 year lease for $1. Um, and they had the 60 day, instead of a mutual termination, they can terminate in 60 days, but we couldn't. The board at that time did not feel comfortable entering into a 50 year lease for $1 uh, because it's a long commitment. I understand we have a 50 year lease with the Elsinore Valley Water District for the lake. And that was used as a comparison. But as you can see in the budget, we're paying them 1.7 million this year and it goes up every single year. So it's, it's a difference. And now I'm speaking for myself um, when I was a board member, why I wasn't comfortable with signing that lease or, or moving forward with that lease. So what we did is uh, very next month, we sent it back to them. We said, okay, we'll go from two to five years for a dollar, but we wanna go back to the 60 day mutual termination that we've had all along. And we did not hear back from them. And time went on. Um, there were some conversations via email, which I have, and all of this can be, you know, you can write to the city through public information and, and ask for all the records. So I'm not, you know, sharing anything that I can't share uh, that you couldn't get through the Public Information Act. But, you know, one of the suggestions that I had is, hey, as our cost, because of this new, with the, uh, the city owning the fire station, our fees were going up for hosting events here. And if anyone's in a club, you've seen that the cost of everything is going up. Um, so with that, one of the suggestions is, well, why don't we enter into, instead of us charging you for the fire station, um, a little bit more for the fire station, why don't you waive the fees? So 4th of July, we can waive those fees. Yesterday, another big one, but some of the bigger events, we can waive those fees. And we, we heard back from the city manager. I do not know if he discussed it ever with city council. So I'm not saying the city council members did this, but he said one has nothing to do with the other. So that was a no. Um, there were some other comments made in that. And I recommend anyone to go get that information. I give them the date and the time of that email because I find it kind of fascinating um, from the city manager of what they might do to negotiate reducing fees for our events if we did something else, which we weren't comfortable with doing. So time went on, we never heard back um, from that lease. And then as we started again, seeing the fees go up, the board started discussing, and I'll take the bullet for this one. Probably should stay away from the bullets and triggers, but I'll take the bullet for this one. Um, I thought we should charge them something more than a dollar. After attending their event, knowing that they had over a $400,000 surplus in their budget, knowing that they approved having a... Um, I'll just say a pot store, what's it called? Cannabis store. And that was gonna bring in an additional million dollars per year in tax revenue. And then also knowing that they had 6 million in reserves that they um, rightfully so are saving because they wanna buy land that is on the other side of the jump lagoon. So potentially they could build more houses to get more tax revenue. And I applaud them for that decision. But I started wondering, I'm like, then why are we going to continue to have members subsidize the fire station if we have to charge the members more because our activities cost more and they have all this extra money, shouldn't they have to pay for it? So we are already starting to do our insurance reviews because one of our board members, Greg, is an insurance expert in commercial. So we were doing a deep dive and we continue to do it thanks to Greg and looking at all our insurance policies. So we had to look at all the buildings and we went out and um, had an appraisal done on the building, which led to finding out what fair market value was. So in December, we sent a new lease to the city and the fair market value for that property is a tad bit. And I mean, just a tad bit under $10,000 a month. So we sent a new lease agreement to them for that amount, which understandably surprised the city that it went, even though you know they were on a month to month since January of 2021, that we would come in and ask for a, a significant increase like that. That led to further discussions because they started doing, I spoke with the mayor, he started having conversations or we started having conversations. He said it would be less expensive for them to purchase a property with all the benefits to it 
and they were looking at acquiring it. We didn't think we had the authority to sell it, so it would be through eminent domain. So that led to further discussions, and um, we knew that they were either going to secure it via eminent domain or a sale of the property. So that's how it transpired. I will say one thing, and again, this is not confidential because it's available through public information. Um, I'm actually glad this happened for, for a few reasons. One, uh, the advantages that they're going to have with grants, and I think that benefits the members um, altogether. Like they can possibly get solar for almost nothing, which is going to help reduce their cost. So I think that's a good thing. Um, if there was a massive earthquake and that building went down, they would be first in line to get that fixed because it is a city owned fire station versus something that they just lease from us. Uh, but what we did find out through this entire process is when the city received, when we sent them the lease back in April, 2022, we didn't find out. We found out in December through emails that they had rejected that lease. We didn't know that. So it was a bit frustrating for me. And I, in retrospect, I was glad that we went this way because we could have been negotiating at that entire time. And I will say I had personal conversations with two city council members. I believe someone else on this board, they can speak for themselves that they want to, had a conversation or several conversations with other city council members where we said, you don't have to buy it. Like we just need a number. If you want a 20, 30, 40 year lease, we just need a number. Even if it's 2000 a month, 3000 a month, that'll help offset the cost um, for the increase of cost for the fees that we, the members collectively pay for our events. And the result was well, we, we want to buy it. So knowing that they were either going to buy it or they were going to get it via eminent domain, that's where, that's kind of the, from the best of my memory right now, but I do have it all written down. All right. It just seems like we're working against each other at times and it, not, it, not yeah. together. I agree. And, yeah. And then it is waterfront property for them. I think they should pay more. Sorry. <laughs> well, I just wanted to comment on the fire station because it came to my mind while you were talking. Uh, you know, no matter how long a lease is, once it has a, a chance that you can get out of it, if it's, you can get out with 60 days notice, you have a 60 day lease, call it a 60 year lease or a 50 year lease. If you can walk after 60 days, you got a 60 day lease. Um, we now have somebody who owns that property to have for a fire station and that keeps it in here. And we, for a long time, wanted to make sure we had a fire station within the city. So, you know, that helps, I, I think it helps keep, keep them here uh, more so than giving them the chance to leave after 60 days and move out just outside the North gate and buy a little piece of property where a guy parks his trailer out there all the time. And, uh, you know, it, it's bad enough for some people who live on the East side and, and out continental that the primary care now comes from that far away, but it could have been uh, even further away in the city. So at least we now have a fire station in the city. They're financially committed to staying here with it. Doesn't mean they can't change that plan, but there's a lot more, uh, equity in it and them involved in the community by owning it. And we're not in that business. Get out of it. And well, and one, one thing that I found interesting at their city council meeting too is when they did the research for them to build a fire station, just even if they had the land, because they were looking at other land um, within Canyon Lake, but to build a fire station is $8 million. So, I mean, if, if they choose to build one, I mean, it, I don't want to say they're getting a good deal because it was fair market value, um, but it's a lot less expensive than if they found a piece of land somewhere. And yeah, I, I think it. there's a little bit of win-win in it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. It's, it's zoned as a community facility. So the city would have to change the zoning and um, they they will also be a member of the POA, so they would have to go through the same process that any property owner here would to make changes to the property. I have a simple question. Once they own the property, uh, do they have to pay the POA dues? Yes. Okay. Bingo. Which is more than the dollar.
Any other member comments? All right, any other comments from the board? Go ahead. I do. Um, I meant to say this earlier, but um, somebody here, uh, not here tonight, that wanted to be here, but one thing, he, he sent me this uh, nice spreadsheet on the last 25 years of our dues. And it starts from 97, 98, um, that our dues were $109 to 2021, um, $293. The average increase through that 25 years is just under 4%. That's if they average it out for the every single year. We had years there that we saw, and you brought it up to Travis, so that you had a year in 05 that went up $15. The next year it went up $30. Um, this is this is 15 and 25% increases in those two years back to back. We also went through a year from 2013 to 2018 where we virtually did not see an increase at all. And I, and we, sorry, my voice is kind of going, but, and, and I'm, I'll credit the past board because in 2019, 2020, uh, which I believe Dale was on that. I mean, you guys had to step up and reserve and start putting some reserves away. We all knew that, you know, we knew, I remember sitting in these meetings um, five years ago, six years ago, and we all knew that this was coming down. We had to pay the piper. So just in the last, you know, three years, we've had a lot of due increases. 5% is a huge um, win, considering that's probably going to be lower than any percent range that we've had in the last three years, considering the economy and the market we're in. Um, but I thought this is a pretty important thing to show that we really average over 25 years about a 4% increase. And like Travis said, you know, I would rather see a steady increase than ups and downs and not going anywhere. I think that's a, a, a huge point you made in that conversation. So um, I just wanted to point that out. <clears throat> Number two, God, it's nice to see all you guys here. Um, the, as much as I, I appreciate seeing Joe, Travis, Valerie, um, all your regulars are always here. Ed, we always love you here, Ed. You should be here every year, every week. Um, <laughs> you are here every week, but you're usually at the bar. Um, but <laughs> sorry, but I just really appreciate you guys all being part of the process. This makes our job so much easier as a board member when you guys are engaged. Us sitting up here looking at each other and looking at the screen is uh, not fun. So I appreciate all your comments and you guys all being here tonight. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I have a couple of comments. One regarding the fire station. I, I, I do like one of the comments that was, I think maybe it was Jeannie made the comment. You know, the fire station is an asset that was <clears throat> that was owned by all 4,800 homeowners. And, and in my mind, <clears throat> whenever we get the proceeds, and I think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to be this year, this fiscal year, but sometime, because that, that may take some time. Whenever we do, I think we ought to do something with the proceeds that benefits all 4,800 members. And uh, and whether it's the road reserves or using it to, to uh, reduce any dues and so forth, I think those are things that, again, something that is owned by all members should be benefited by all members in my personal opinion. Um, <clears throat> I don't see, I, I, uh, I participated in the budget reviews and workshops. And so I got firsthand knowledge uh, and experience with, with all the members. And, and I wanna thank the finance committee. They do spend a lot of time, their own time doing it two full days, eight to five, we, uh, we spent in there <clears throat> wrangling through things, but also the, the staff, the staff endured a lot of questions. <clears throat> and, and so I appreciate, you know, just the process overall was good. Um, so I wanna thank the finance committee for coming up with, with good recommendations. There is an unsung hero in all of this <clears throat> that many of you don't know, and that's Susan Dowood, our controller. Um, she, <clears throat> she, she is exceptional. She does a great job, and she, um, she can handle a group of, of nine angry men. <laughs> um, so in looking at the budget, I don't see any reductions that I personally recommend. There is one thing, and, and you know, I know you've heard this from me before. This is, this is my soapbox, so I'm gonna get it for just a moment. Um, <clears throat> I participated in a joint executive committee with the city with Tim Cook, and we looked at ways to, to improve our, our overall <clears throat> security. And one of the things we learned in there was, you know, we talked about uh, code enforcement or other different things, but one of, the, one of the good nuggets that came out of those discussions was, 
was offered by the Riverside Sheriff's Office, right? RSO, RSO came in and said, you know, there's a program <clears throat> that most cities use to, to, to escrow an amount of money uh, with the RSO. And when you need additional sheriff support, <clears throat> you can kind of buy it by, by the hour, so to speak. And if you don't use it at the end of the year, it either gets returned to you or you can roll it forward to, a, to another year, which I think is a good program. Um, <clears throat> as we go through the budget, one of the things that I would like to see us do, whether it's adding an, an amount of funding into uh, an account to, to get us additional uh, sheriff's patrols, or if there's an underrun in our community service, uh, community patrol uh, uh, contract, to use some of those funds uh, to, to do that. If, for instance, we were to go escrow $200,000, it's a lot, um, that would translate to about a $3.50 increase to, to most members. And, and it's something I, I think I would like to see us consider um, as we go through our budget deliberation. So are, are you talking about the money would be used when we're already, I don't want to say renting, that sounds awful, but requesting, requesting the sheriffs to be there for, for what we already spend for 4th of July? Or are you talking above what we do for 4th of July and Fiesta Day yeah. as supplementing just or paying to have more police here. For... Right, this would be an addition to, we already do it for that now. Now, one one unique instance that we have is right now we contract directly with RSO for those support services. If we work out a cooperative arrangement with the city, we can we can get those same services for 80, for 20% less. Um, and so, yeah, if as part of our normal discussions about how do we improve security, it's, it's a joint uh, responsibility, you know, the, the POA only has so much responsibility for our own facilities and, and our rules, and that's what our community patrol does. But if we want to talk about other security of, you know, we've had cars cars broken into and cars stolen and so forth, that's that's a partnership we have to have with the city. So I want to see one of my recommendations is to have our, our POA board uh, work together to see if we can come up with some recommendations with the city to further improve our security. Ron, if I comment on that? Please. Okay. So... For me, my, I, I agree with uh, being able to prepay at a discount so to secure RSO for those times that we already have them. So whenever having our special events, we absolutely have them here for Fiesta Day, 4th of July, and other major events. My concern about the members of this community who already pay city taxes paying more through members' dues to subsidize the city to have more RSO officers, which is their responsibility. That's my concern. They can, if they want to protect the citizens, they can and should look at other ways, whether that is dipping into their reserves, dipping into their surplus, uh, maybe using some of the cannabis funds. Th those are some of the options. Uh, the other thing too is just, you know, I did some research on police to citizens and in our neighboring city, Menifee, and then another one in Marietta, uh, they average, it's about for every one officer, 1,500 citizens. And we have one RSO to 10,000 citizens. So instead of asking the members to pay more for that, I would ask the city to consider figuring out a way if we need to have more sheriffs figure out a way to do that. Um, and that might be, they have to put something on the ballot to raise taxes because we don't have a great revenue, uh, tax revenue source across the way. You know, they're not Menifee, you know, they don't have the target and the low. So I understand that's a challenge and it might be a call for the citizens to have to do that. Um, but that's just my thoughts behind it. Any other member or board comments? Oh, yep, great. Oh, no, you're good. Oh, okay. Well, with that, I want to thank everyone. Special thanks. I mean, Bill hit it with thanking everyone, um, especially the finance committee and all the time they put into it. And Susan, you really are the star of this show. And I, yeah, we have mm, fun. you are so brilliant. And I'm always and constantly amazed by you. And I am so grateful that you're with the POA, please don't ever leave or we're in a world of hurt. So please don't ever leave. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and enjoy the meeting. Thank you.